Okay, welcome everyone. If your circadian rhythm is giving you some issues and your beat might be off, this is the place to be. Normally at the beginning of the year, I've discussed seasonal affect disorder. And well, now the DSM-5 in 2013, they changed their rules and they feel that seasonal affect disorder is not a disorder on its own anymore. It's now a depressive descriptor and that it has a seasonal pattern. So doesn't mean that it's not a real thing anymore. It just means that it affects us in different ways and they find that it's more ap apropos with regards to major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder. So in keeping with the times, we're gonna talk about some very important elements of that particular disorder, which we may all be able to relate to or have problems with at any time of the year. So not just in winter time. Um, when our rhythm is a little bit off, all beings, plant, animal, insect, even bacteria have biological rhythms and they're often described as clocks. And these are repetitive processes in terms of seconds, hours, or decades. And they're responsive to the environment and other biological processes. Think of eating, hunger, um, any kind of cycles that we go through, impregnation uh, to birth, menstruation to menopause, mating, all those things. The most well-known and studied is the 24-hour clock of the circadian rhythm. So circadian comes from a Roman circa diem, which translates to approximately a day. So that would be anything that repeats itself within a 24 hour period. So many of our biological functions have tiny circadian rhythms that guide our organs, like our kidneys, our liver, everything. And that is our focus today. Your circadian rhythm is your body's natural way of responding to its environment to maintain this 24 hour clock, helping your body to keep everything healthy. Your rhythm's maintained by external influences that can be easily knocked off balance. For example, seasons. So as the cartoon states, summer is too hot, winter is too cold to go outside. So we're becoming a society that stays inside. Or changing to and from daylight savings time, travel to a different time zone, shift work, uh, uncontrolled change schedules at home, like new additions to the family, babies or pets. Medical issues that affect energy, mood, sleep, or develop, developmental stages that change your hormone levels, like menopause. Uh, even our habits that change on our days off. We often think we can go out and party on the weekends and not have to pay for that. But in fact, that actually shifts our rhythm off just a bit. So regardless of the cause, symptoms can be mild to severe. And I'm not going to read these all, but they can all be affected with regards to appetite, eating changes, sleeping pattern changes, um, like difficulty falling asleep, waking up, insomnia, fatigue, depression, anxiety, increased stress response, as well as a role in the development of longer term health issues. And that's one of the bigger concerns because we don't see that immediately. That's the long term aspect of it. So diabetes, Alzheimer's, things like that. Um, it aggravates any current conditions that you already have, as well as putting you on a road to developing more of these long-term conditions. Everything gets worse. So the circadian clock plays a physical, mental, and behavioral role that responds to external cues known as, oh, German is not my best, but Zeitgebers. <laughs> Zeitgebers mean time givers. And it's a term used in science all the time for these things, but light's the main external component of this control. So even people who are visually impaired, which my, my sister is uh, legally blind and she still has her circadian clock. I always find it amazing, but it's different things in our eyes. So these photosensitive cells that respond um, melapsipin is what it's called. So it's not the rods and cones that create the vision in your eyes, but melapsipin is made up of these photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. So they send messages, lots of terminology here, to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. 
we're just going to call that the SCN. The SCN is this little area within the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus itself is this teeny tiny little spot in your brain. That's the master clock. The SCN is the major regulator of your circadian rhythm, and it's the light exposure or lack of light exposure that has the most effect when it's hitting the cells in the back of your eye, letting your brain know whether it's day or night. The SCN is then prompted to provide this information to the pineal gland. Depending on the amount of light and the message of the SCN, the pineal gland will initiate the production and release of either serotonin or melatonin. So more on serotonin and melatonin in a minute, because they're pretty key. Light is the most important catalyst in this process and how it affects our sleep, but the other important system equally, equally affecting our sleep is the homeostatic urge. So the homeostatic urge, it's another great stabilizer of sleep for our bodies. The moment you wake up in the morning, if you look at the emojis that I've put in the bottom of this slide, they correlate to what's going on because I need a visual when I see charts like this. But as soon as you get up in the morning, the pressure urge to sleep builds as we stay awake and then drops as, as we go on. So let's talk a little bit about, um, keep, keep that idea in mind about your homeostatic urge. And then we're gonna talk about the key players of serotonin and melatonin because these two hormones are linked. They play together all the time. Serotonin is primary amongst many hormones that you have with regards to feelings of well being, happiness, awake, alert. Serotonin production is directly related to how much bright light that you're exposed to. So, the brighter the sunshine, the longer an individual's exposure to it, the more serotonin the brain will produce. Serotonin is also produced in the gut by using amino acids, specifically tryptophan. And tryptophan is one of those ones that we can get when we eat things like egg whites, um, meats, nuts and seeds, or small amounts are in fruits like bananas. And for somebody who's a vegetarian, this could be an issue for them not getting enough tryptophan. And you need the tryptophan in your diet because it's critical in order to ensure that your body has the building blocks that it needs to make the serotonin. And the serotonin then converts to melatonin and allows you to have that high quality sleep that you need. So if you have these building blocks, you're eating a healthy diet, you're getting sunlight, then you're going to be making serotonin and you're going to feel happy and well, your brain produces and stores up that serotonin. And then it does that during the day when the sun goes lower in the sky, your brain converts that to melatonin for a really good sleep. Melatonin on the flip side is produced when light becomes dimmer. So it's triggered by the darkness. So remember the SCN in the hypothalamus from the other slide. Um, it senses the dimmer light and the penile gland starts the synthesis of melatonin from the serotonin that you've built up during the day. Shortly after, melatonin is secreted into your bloodstream and you start to feel sleepy. So the concentration of the melatonin in your blood throughout the day carries a lot of functions within our bodies. So the most important um, that it does is it's a very, very powerful broad spectrum antioxidant. So we hear a lot about getting the antioxidants in your diet. This isn't an antioxidant in your diet. This is an antioxidant that your body actually makes. And it's very crucial that your body makes enough melatonin in order to clear out all the crap that's built up. So it, during the night, when you sleep, the melatonin comes out, mops up all the chemical junk that your biological functions have created during the daytime. And it's so important that the links of this decreased melatonin from any circadian rhythm disturbance leads to problems with your immune function and increased risk of all cancers, heart disease, obesity, like I mentioned before, long-term issues, they'll start to build. 
And moreover, the timing of sufficient melatonin concentrations has a large impact on sleep quality. So even if you do manage to fall asleep with low melatonin concentrations in your blood, you'll experience less of that critical stage three and REM sleep stages that are most physically and mentally restorative processes. Now these guys, melatonin and serotonin must work in tandem in order to maintain a healthy circadian rhythm. And your circadian rhythm works in tandem with your homeostatic urge to sleep. So this slide shows you how they all work together in order to make your sleep pattern happen in a normal way. So all these processes ensure you get a good sleep and feel restored each day. Sometimes our bodies produce a higher drive for sleep, like when the immune system is fighting an infection, it produces more immune mediators causing more sleepiness. So that's often why, you know, we go to bed when we're feeling not so well. So it's our body's response. You need more sleep. Uh, also, interestingly enough, this also happens when you do a lot of cognitive activity. So physically stimulating things, if you're working in um, some kind of labor job for a while and you're doing a lot of physical work or you're doing a lot of mental work, and that can also include sightseeing. If you're a tourist, if you're navigating in an environment where you're not familiar, that all increases and stimulates your body's demand for further sleep. So as a result, your sleep may be longer and deeper after any of these experiences. Now I have a three minute video that I would like to play at this point in time, and I'll hand that over. Awake and when to be asleep. We spend around one third of our lives sleeping but being able to sleep well is actually quite a complicated process. Scientists therefore developed the two process model of sleep regulation to help explain how sleep and wake are controlled. According to this model, two processes regulate our sleep-wake pattern. The first process, called process S, refers to the buildup of sleep pressure. This pressure to sleep builds up during wakefulness and then decreases as we sleep. For most people, being awake for 16 hours will build up enough sleep pressure to be able to fall asleep and stay asleep for around eight hours. Another way to think about process S is to liken it to hunger. The longer we go without food, the hungrier we get. But once we eat a big meal, we need to wait a while until we're hungry again. Process S is homeostatic, meaning we can only go so long without sleep before our sleep pressure builds up so high that we can't maintain wakefulness. Like when you stay up really late to watch a movie, but fall asleep during it. Other times, behaviours like napping or sleeping in can reduce our sleep pressure and make it more difficult to fall asleep at night. So process S explains sleep pressure, but how does our body know to sleep at night? The second process, process C, is responsible for the timing of sleep. Process C refers to our circadian rhythm, which is a 24 hour cycle that oscillates like a sine wave. There are many important bodily processes that follow this 24 hour cycle including body temperature, digestion, and hormone production. For example, our brain produces melatonin at night when it's dark, but suppresses melatonin production in the morning and throughout the day whilst it's light. Process S and Process C work independently, but we get the best sleep when they're working together with a constant push and pull between them. Unfortunately, there are times when the two processes get out of sync, and this can often lead to disrupted sleep. For example, if you work the night shift and have been awake for 24 hours, you may fall asleep quickly, only to be woken by your body clock a few hours later. In other words, process S is ready to go to sleep, but process C wants to be awake. This phenomenon also explains jet lag, with our body clock not quite adjusting to the new time zone, despite us being awake for many hours in transit. So there you have the two process model of sleep regulation. Whilst it doesn't explain everything about sleep weight regulation, it's a really useful conceptual model that allows us to understand how process S and process C work together to help get you a good night's sleep. Great, so that was a bit of a review and I just wanna share my screen again.
Okay. And what I'd like to do then is just keep that in mind as we go through this and realize that at this point in time, if you are starting to think that you're having problems with regards to your sleep and your circadian rhythm, the issue is to pinpoint the cause to change what you can. So even though light is the key, other factors are also involved. So try to think about what the cause is for you. Get help or delegate chores to, to others. Think about your work activities. You may not have a lot of control in your work environment, but it's worth a try to discuss making changes and shift compromises. Don't ignore any signs and symptoms. Sometimes just a phone call appointment with a healthcare provider can shed light on problems in a helpful way. We all have our technology, TV, computers, games, phones, iPads, etc. And it's for our comfort inside. If it's a nasty day and we don't have a reason, we don't go out, this isolation can all lead to or aggravate depression, promote negative physical changes within our circadian rhythm need to make changes in order to deal with that kind of thing. So this is the pinpointing of the cause so you can change it. Incorporate a plan for good sleep-wake hygiene. I can't emphasize this enough. Making a plan for sleep-wake hygiene is probably the most important thing that you can do and make a schedule and stick to it. And oftentimes, depending on your job or your spouse's job or schedules of other people that you might live with or live around, this could be a problem. And yet it is the most important thing that you can do for yourself. Any changes that might be particular to you in order to help put you back on track is the most important thing. So as I said, the two most important things are the sleep-wake routine, and we're going to talk about that later. So sleep-wake hygiene and keeping a regular schedule. So We'll discuss in detail some of these issues, but just to highlight them, some things you can do right away to start alleviating your problem is to deal with lifestyle issues. And I harp about this on almost every webinar I give. Lifestyle, exercise, and diet. Exercise and diet are like the number one thing that you can do to help yourself with almost anything that's causing you problems within your biological body basically keeping active. And if you can do it, go outside, decrease your stress levels, try yoga, meditation, pursue a hobby, eat a diet rich in more vegetables and vitamin D rich foods, such as fish oil, liver, egg yolks. You want to get your tryptophans in your diet. Uh, focus on your routines that you perform throughout the day to maximize your sleep, re-energize your body, ensure your alertness and productivity. So sleep-wake hygiene is very basic common sense stuff, but it's things that we tend to push aside and rationalize when modern life gets to us and we let stuff go like our exercise. It's probably one of the first things that we take out of our routines. So it's a matter of trying to hang on to those things and your, your bedtime schedule, that kind of stuff. Supplements of melatonin can be purchased at most pharmacies as well as you know, online stuff, um, Walmart, Target, but online is where I order things. Um, and you should take 0.3 to one milligram of melatonin. And always remember your melatonin starts to get released as the sun gets dimmer. So you want to take it because it takes about 30 minutes before it starts to work. Um, light therapy. We're going to talk a little more about light boxes uh, and how light influences you and what you can do about it. Because some of us live in places where we don't always get the light that we need. Um, you may need assistance. So it, maybe you've tried a lot of these things already. And now you're to a point where I just don't know what to do. Counseling and monitoring. Talk therapy, if it's available to you, it's quite helpful. Again, you can always make a telephone appointment with your healthcare provider. That's easy to do. Um, keep a health diary. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned, but I was having some issues that seemed to be very physical. And as it turned out, it was stress related. And part of that stress came from the fact that I wasn't sleeping properly. So it's easy to see how one thing leads to another. So it's a, it, it's a road, it's a road. And once you start down a road, you might not think it's very 
severe at the moment, but it can quickly start to pick up like a snowball running down a hill. Um, psychotherapy is not something that's available to everybody and neither is acupuncture. If you can get it, great. If it works for you, great. Doesn't always work for everyone. So you try what you can. Find out what's covered by your healthcare plan and then use whatever you can to your advantage. And of course, there may be things that you have to pay out of pocket for. And if they work for you, then it's well worth it. So medications, if you do get to the point where your healthcare provider gets involved and suggests antidepressants or mood stabilizers, or even a hormone replacement, because menopause can also cause a lot of these hormone changes that can screw up your circadian rhythm. Don't be afraid of taking them, but discuss in detail with your healthcare provider why you're taking them, what are the side effects, and make an informed choice. Have I tried everything that I can do with regards to exercise and diet before I jump into taking a medication? Or maybe you are the type of person that right now you can't deal with the exercise and diet. So taking the medication is the better route. So think about that. Don't think you're going to be diagnosed with depression or, or whatever, just because you're taking some medications. So yeah, an antidepressant can be going for a walk out in nature, getting your headspace into a more relaxing atmosphere, but it can also be a medication that's provided for you from your healthcare clinic. So let's uh, focus on sleep, wake hygiene. I call it sleep, wake hygiene. Uh, it's known by many other way, other terms, but, um, basically I just want to make sure that you understand it's not necessarily day or night. It has to do with your sleep time and your wake time. And it can be different, especially with regards to shift workers. So facts are there 10 to 32% of shift workers develop what we call shift worker disorder. And it's recognized by all sleep associations all over the world. And they tend to forget about their sleep-wake hygiene and they try to maintain a similar routine to non-shift worker schedules. And this disrupts the circadian rhythm so much. The consequences, like I already mentioned, with regards to the shift worker disorder, they are definitely on the road. Their increased risk of cardiovascular, metabolic problems, cancer, gastrointestinal issues, it rises significantly when they're, when they're working shifts. So this might be applicable to you if you have any changes in your lifestyle, like we mentioned already, uh, new additions to the family or a schedule change, a move. A lot of those things will change your schedule and that little bit of change in the schedule is going to screw up your circadian rhythm. So if we look at wake time, focus on the wake time. So I don't want to say, you know, jump out of bed and be happy in the morning. That's not necessarily what I'm trying to get here, but open up the shades, let the sun in, don't hit the snooze button, set alarms as necessary. Maybe you need to put the alarm outside the door. So you actually have to get up to turn it off. They have dawn simulators or LED smart lights. You can have those set up so it comes on gently. So you wake up gently with the light and it allows your body to switch off the melatonin and start producing serotonin. Grab some coffee or tea. Uh, matcha tea actually has more caffeine per cup than coffee or tea. So if you're into matcha tea, that's the best way to go. Um, caffeine suppresses adenosine. And adenosine is the thing in your nervous system that promotes sleep and suppresses arousal. So you want your caffeine in order to suppress the adenosine. So caffeine's not necessarily a bad thing. And you can actually count it as fluids that you're intaking. I know that a lot of nurses and other medical personnel that I've talked to often tell me, oh, I can't count my caffeine but that's a bit of a myth. Um, it does cause you to go to the bathroom more and you're going to get rid of a lot more fluids, but it's still giving you fluid as well. So you can count it as 
your water intake as well. But if you're constantly only having something with caffeine, it, it's not going to help you so much. So if you're the kind of person who can get up and do activity in the morning, great. Warm up exercises. I have a girlfriend who goes on her rowing machine and all she does is like, it's like five minutes, five minutes in the morning, but that five minutes is enough to change what's going on in the brain and kick you into gear for the day. So just if you can do something, even if it's a small thing, do it. But whatever you do, you don't want to leave your workout until later on in the day. Get it done earlier. Earlier is the better. And you want to try to get outside for 30 minutes a day just because it's better lux light. And I'll mention that in a minute. Eat or drink something nutritious soon after you get up. So I'm not saying have a big breakfast, but even if you have a glass of juice, it again, starts the whole system working. It kicks in your metabolism. Uh, if you can possibly make your healthy choices for foods rich in vitamin D or tryptophan, avoid sugars, ensure your biggest meal is at least four hours before bed and any medications that you need to take, you make sure you take them. So this is just a little slide with regards to what we need as we get older and we need more sleep of course when we're younger and then we level out and that leveling out means that at this point in our lives for most of us as adults we need seven to nine hours of sleep there's some controversy with regards to research um, some people tend to work better in different modes they tend to work better in split sleeps so they sleep for a little bit and then they're awake and then they sleep for a little bit again. Um, but I'm generalizing within this presentation. Again, that's something that you might need to talk to your healthcare provider about, but seven to nine hours. And if you know what time you have to get up, allow yourself the time in bed to sleep that sufficient amount of time. Some people use an alarm clock in the morning, but you can also use an alarm clock at night to tell you when to go to bed. And if you're using a device like a Fitbit, uh, a watch to calculate what sleep you get, just be aware that they're not always accurate because they're keyed to measure movement, not actually sleep. Then when you're ready to sleep, maximizing your sleep time, like I mentioned, you have to start well before bedtime. Avoid caffeine seven hours before bedtime. Stop eating four hours prior. Alcohol interferes with sleep quality. Yes, you do feel drowsy, but it's the quality of sleep. So it's best to avoid it three hours before bedtime. And if you wanna try melatonin 30 minutes prior to bedtime, help your sleep environment to promote sleep, pull the curtains and the shades, take away the stimulants, turn off the screens. If you can take TV, phones, laptops, take it out of the bedroom alerts and notifications sometimes just that brightening screen can be something that your eyes pick up so turn your phone upside down so you don't have those notifications or turn them off altogether and because it's blue light our eyes respond more to that blue light so there's lots of apps that you have nowadays that you can set them onto red light for the evening and nighttime. So if you do have to use a device, you wanna have it switched over. There's, there's lots of free apps available, or sometimes you can have it set up on your laptop to automatically change over. Um, but you can also have blue light blocking lenses. You can even wear sunglasses. I've tried sunglasses, it doesn't really help, but I have purchased the blue light lenses and I, they're just like wearing normal glasses for me except because of the tint in them, I can read what I need to read right before I go to bed and turn it off. And I don't, I don't feel that same stress in my eyes anymore. Um, I used to feel like a burny sensation. And dawn dusk simulators. I know people who swear by them, who as, as the dimmer goes down, they realize they'll set it as soon as they get up into their bed. So within 30 minutes, it goes down to complete pitch black and they swear by those things. And they do the same thing in the morning with the dawn simulator. Um, 
if you feel that you need to have your phone near you in case you're going to miss something or you're going to forget something, keep a paper and pen close to you and then write it down, scribble it down if you need to. Um, cool mist diffusers. Um, there's one pictured here that you can put on a timer and you can put aroma or no aroma. It's also good to hydrate you, especially if it's winter time that you're having more issues with regards to your sleep. Um, sprays for your pillows, roll-ons um, that you put on, on your um, pulse points so that they release an aroma that's pleasant, that it helps your body to relax. Sleep masks, earplugs, anything that you can just take away any of the stimuli and try to get more relaxation at night. Try all of these things. It, it's amazing. If you haven't tried it, you don't know. I often thought I couldn't wear a sleep mask because something around my head would just drive me crazy. And, and it's true, I end up ditching it in the middle of the night. But at first, it really helped me to go to sleep. And when I travel, it's one of the best things that I have because it can make nighttime happen anywhere instantly for me. Breathing exercises, mindfulness, meditation, or yoga. There's apps on your phone. I'll mention a couple um, within this presentation. But if you have a partner, if you can talk the partner into doing a meditation at night before you go to sleep, it can help to bring everything down. However, if you have a partner, you also have to deal with other things. You might have to deal with their snoring, pulling blankets, kicking, their dreams, their issues. So you may have to have a conversation with your roommate in order to fix what's going on in your sleep time. Uh, opening up the window, getting a cool environment, it helps you to sleep better. A lot of people swear by uh, a big cozy duvet or a weighted blanket. Weighted blankets are all the rage right now. Um, put a do not disturb sign up, make sure people know, um, no, I'm going to sleep now and that's it. Um, take any medications, that you need. And uh, there's, there's many over the counter medications that people have said that they've tried. You just have to watch your long term use of these products. For example, people will use Gravol because of its sedative effect. Short term, great. But long term, no, it's a bad thing. Um, so is uh, diphenhydramine, which is uh, Benadryl. People often use Benadryl because of the sleepiness effect. Short term, yes. Long term, say no. And I just want to clarify, um, we do need vitamin D. And I mentioned that you should get out in the sun because it's better lux. It's better light for you. However, um, we do need the serotonin production. And of course, the good news is if you get the vitamin D from the sun on your skin, it produces fat soluble vitamin D one, two, and three. So when you go outside, you will get vitamin D production in your own skin. So if it's reasonable for you to go outside without sunscreen for 30 minutes, that's great. I, for example, go for an hour and a half long walk in the morning, at least an hour. So I put sunscreen on because it's an SPF 30. And because it's an SPF 30, I know I'm still getting enough sun after 30 minutes of exposure. I'll be getting enough sun that I will be able to produce my vitamin D for that day. So I do wear sunscreen because I know I'm going to be out for a long time. If you're not going out for a long time, but you can spare 30 minutes to pop outside and do something, then do it. And just to make you aware, a tanning bed is not, not the same as a light box. It's not the same as going outside. It has ultraviolet rays in it. So your body needs UVB light to make vitamin D. And this can't happen when you're, when you're sitting by a window, you might think, oh, I'm in the sun because I'm sitting by a window. No, not going to happen. Uh, it's not going to happen in a tanning bed at all. They have ultraviolet light. 
which affects the skin. So it is UVA and UVB, but the amount that it gives you is not going to give you the amount that you need without causing more damage to your skin. Sometimes in the medical world, we will tell people to use a tanning bed for certain skin disorders, such as psoriasis. And the thing is, light therapy is good for stuff like that, but it affects both your skin and your eyes. So you can actually, if you're using it, thinking that it's replacing your light, it's going to irritate your skin if you have normal skin and it's going to irritate your eyes and you're not going to get the same quality of vitamin D that you would just from being outside. But you can always have supplements. That's another option. So just to recap, these are some of the foods. It's a short list, but it's probably the more things in there that, that you would naturally see within your diet. And to be aware that it's a fat soluble vitamin because it's a fat soluble vitamin, your body stores it and uses it as it's needed. So you can take vitamin D supplement once a week, or you can take it every day in smaller amounts. It's whatever works best for you. If you're not the kind of person who remembers pills every day, then an everyday supplement isn't the way to go for you. So you got to look at yourself and your needs. So if you lack vitamin D, there's a whole lot of effects in your body. Vitamin D isn't just dealing with your sleep and your circadian rhythm. There's so many things that vitamin D does within your body. I can't even possibly tell you them all here, <laughs> but it's something that we recognize people are lacking, whether it's just that we stay inside more often or we're not eating properly or we just use a lot more sunscreen because we're more aware of it. Scientists aren't really sure. But overall, I think the latest study was done in the UK and it showed one in five, one in five people had a significant decrease in vitamin D and required supplements. One in five is a pretty high figure. So it's not something that we typically in the medical world test for but you can ask your healthcare provider for a test. It's a, it's a blood test. So you would need to get it done and you won't get the results right away because it has to be sent off. It has to be kept cold, all this kind of stuff. There's a home test, questionable whether that one works as well. You can try it if you're curious. I would say if you're curious, then possibly to ease your mind, you might wanna take the supplements. And if you want to replenish, like if you're sure, if you're absolutely sure that you need to replenish because you're low on vitamin D, take 2000 international units every day for six weeks, and then go back to your daily thriving dosage, which is um, 600 to 1000 every day. Or like I said, you can take all that once a week, whatever, because it is fat soluble. The other thing is light therapy. So on the whole theme of vitamin D, making our own vitamin D with a good light source, like the, this comic says, this is for my depression, go get your own. But if you consider using a light box, light therapy, heliotherapy, phototherapy, bright light therapy, however you want to refer to it, it affects brain chemicals linked to mood and sleep but you can also benefit other people. So you can share your light with others. And, you know, having one in an office, if you have two of you working together, you can put a light box between you and you'll both benefit from it. You can easily get a light box therapy. You can buy them online. You can buy them in stores. I mean, I haven't been out to a store in forever, <laughs> but I, I get so many things online. And we did purchase one this past year. So we have one upstairs and we have one downstairs because we find that we spend more time. I spend more time in one room. My partner spends more time in another room. So we've had to divide up and get two. So you can buy them, but I'll just uh, keep in mind that there's certain things that you want to look for and they can be pricey. So compare, um, you want to look for led lights because they last longer. Uh, 
and you want to make sure it says that it omits UV rays. You don't want the UV rays. Some of them will actually say that they have UVB. And if they have UVB, that's to help get your vitamin D production going. It will help. So that's not such a bad thing. So like I said, compare. Um, it, it's best to get your light for serotonin, not vitamin D from a light box. So when you're looking at your light box, think serotonin. When you're looking at your diet, think vitamin D. So light box is to get your serotonin going. So it's to get the light into your eyes. Vitamin D you're going to get from your diet or real sun. So you want to look for a light box that's 2,500 to 10,000 lux. The most is 10,000 lux. That's kind of the ideal that medical would prescribe to you. And white light tends to be the norm. And recommendations are for 30 minutes. So 30 minutes, 10,000 lux every day of white light. And this is based on your cell response to white light. However, so many studies are now more popular saying that blue light is the way to go. So you can find light boxes that have both white and blue light in them. So if you have that option, it's nice to try both. And the nice thing is, is that you can try it. If it doesn't work for you, then don't use it. It's, it's easy. White light is usually really good for everybody, but not everybody can handle blue light because it does tend to be a bit more reactive. So it can actually irritate you a little bit. Um, depending on your body, you have to figure out what your needs are. And if you get too much, this irritability that you could get from blue light, it happens um, if you're too close or too long with the light. And you'll find like you, you could get irritability, insomnia, um, and all you have to do is stop it. That's, that's the thing with light therapy, you can just stop it and all those things go away. So you want it to, to go indirectly. So you're going to sit close to it, but not that close, like the picture here. And she's doing something else. You could be working on your computer, having your breakfast, whatever. It's best to use it earlier on in your day to get your serotonin going. Cause it wakes you up. But like I said, if you're having any issues, eye strain, headache, nausea, irritating, agitation, mania, <laughs> if you're bipolar, definitely don't use it. But the nice thing about light therapy is that if you have any uncomfortable reactions, just stop it. And all of these things go away. Don't use light therapy. Absolutely not. If you have any sensitivity issues with regards to your skin. Um, if you're taking antibiotics, anti-inflammatories or St. John's wort, um, and this includes like our regular anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen, Advil, um, anybody known to have bipolar disorder definitely shouldn't proceed with light therapy without medical supervision. And the hard part is calculating what you need. Um, in our Northern communities, during the winter time, the light fluctuation tends to be quite intense where we're getting so many hours of darkness during the day. So calculating how much light we need can be very confusing and relatively impossible. So I can just give you a few hints. Like this slide is pretty interesting. Um, the lux that we're talking about is a complicated sort of, um, scientific measurement of the strength of light. But you can see here how much light you get on a sunny day, just being out in the light and even indirect light from that sunny day. So that means like standing under a tree, you're still getting a lot of light, but then you go down this little circle thing and you see where your home lighting, your office, they're actually quite small, the amount of lux that you get. And it's amazing. I step outside for 10 minutes and you, bam, you get that much more light. So it just gives you an idea of how you need to think about your, how, how much light you're getting in a day and think about it. You can download apps 
there's lots of apps that you can use within your home and you can see whether when you're sitting close to a certain window, maybe you're getting more lux there, but I recommend them. There's always advertisements on them, but most of them are free, but think about it as a dose of light equals the brightness of the light plus the proximity to the eye multiplied by the duration of exposure. So an increase in any of these figures increases the dose that you get. So if you can increase any of these things, don't, don't just increase the proximity to your eye because then you can have eye issues. But you know what I mean is just to try and maximize any of these things so you can maximize your light. Okay, sum up. Okay, so if you're feeling out of whack, feeling out of whack can lead to all kinds of bad things and you want to fix it or maintain what you're doing. So you want to prevent it from getting worse or you want to make it better. So you deal with the situation beforehand or during. If you know that you're going on a trip, if you know that you're going on a move overseas, there's so many things that you can do to prepare yourself. And oftentimes we do prepare ourselves in a lot of ways. However, we forget stuff. So really think about it, make a schedule, stick to it, pay attention and support a healthy sleep, wake hygiene, figure out what you need, get your vitamin D by light or diet, exercise and activity are your friends. I know you don't always like them, but they're your friends. Mm -hmm. Seek help when necessary. Don't be afraid to call your health care provider. And you know what? I always say, you know, you don't necessarily have to get on the phone with a doctor. You can make an appointment with the nurse practitioner or with one of the physician's assistants and GK medical clinic has lots of phone consultation appointments available for you. These are the, you'll be getting um, access to slides when I'm done with this presentation for anyone who's joined us and those who did sign up, but these are websites that I've used that you can go back into. And if you want to look at something specific for what you're going through, the University of Michigan Sleep Disorders Center, they have so much information. Um, I, I found this one useful. Also the American Academy of Sleep, um, the Canadian Society. I love this one. It's bilingual. Some of the things cost money, but it, just the fact that it's Canadian is really kind of nice. Um, the video that we watched was actually um, from the University of Michigan and uh, they have a sleep challenge. So I've been tempted to sign up for it, but by all means, if anybody does, I'd love to hear your feedback and how it went, but uh, they use all your information for research purposes. So if you are having issues, it could be a way to go. You might get some feedback on your own. So you won't have to go to a healthcare provider, but you can try and mitigate things on your own. World Sleep Day. Who knew there was a World Sleep Day? Um, this uh, 2021, it was Friday the 19th of March. And next year, well, anyway, next year doesn't matter <laughs> because next year we're going to do this closer to the time. But um, there's so many things that you can do in order to participate in this as well. So it's kind of a fun thing if you have children. Um, they can participate and also learn a lot about sleep so that when you tell them to go to bed, they're not so grumpy about it. It's more interesting. Uh, this is another organization that helps kids sweet dreams. There's YouTube videos available that children can watch and they can also um, get some information. Parents can get some information about how to help kids sleep. So they're really focusing on children because you know what? No one teaches this kind of stuff in school. We sort of learn it on our own. There's a couple of apps. I like the My Circadian Clock. It's a free app. So if you've got the time, it's available on iPhone and your data will be used for research, but I like that it's free. And I like that it tells you a lot of information. It's just how useful it is to you is how much you use it. 
the other one, Circadian Rhythm, that I have at the bottom of this slide, it's a free app, but it doesn't have the same amount of information. And uh, your data is used for research as well, but you have to pay for a subscription to get the things that are actually more important to you. And Canadian Sleep and Circadian Network, again, bilingual. I love this one. It's focused more specifically towards people who work shift work, but it has so much information. It's kind of a whole learning program you can go through. It's an interactive web tutorial site. So in both French and English, it is, it's lovely with lots of information. And I just have to throw this in here. When I was setting up this presentation, I usually try to get something to take my mind off of what I'm working on. And so I picked up this book, it's called The 4% Fix by Karma Brown. And it actually is about circadian rhythm. And it's about using 4% of your time more usefully in your life. So I found that it really tied in with regards to what we're doing uh, today, talking about circadian rhythm, because you're talking about using your time wisely. So it falls into that whole scheduling issue because very often we find I don't have enough time in the day. So it's an interesting read as well. And that is it. If you have any questions or would like to follow up because you have thought of something later, please by all means contact me. I have voicemail, it's private, only I have access to it. And I have a Danish cell, but I also have a Canadian number. So feel free to email me or contact me if you need to. And thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it.